Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, written to a church community that Paul knew really well. Corinth was a major port city in the ancient world and had lots of temples to Greek and Roman gods. It was a big economic center. And so Paul strategically came here as a missionary. He spent a year and a half there getting to know people, talking to them about Jesus. And a whole bunch of people became followers of Jesus and formed a church community. You can read about all of this in Acts chapter 18. So after a while, Paul moved on to start churches in other cities, and he started getting reports that things were not going well at all back at the church in Corinth. It was plagued by all kinds of problems, and that's why he wrote this letter. It's broken up into five main parts along with a final greeting. And these five sections correspond to five main problems that Paul is addressing. And so the letter reads like a collection of short essays on different topics, but there are these core ideas that unite all of the pieces together. So here's what he does in each section. He describes the problem, but then he always responds to that problem with some part of the story of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus. And he shows how they're actually not living out what they say they believe. And so this letter is all about learning to think about every area of life through the lens of the gospel. So let's dive in and see how he does it. In chapters one through four, the problem is that there are these divisions in the church. There are some other teachers who had come through town since Paul left, a guy named Apollos and then Peter, and people had picked their favorite teacher and then became groupies around that leader and then started to talk bad and disrespect people who favored another leader or teacher. And so Paul, his response to this is kind of sarcastic and sharp. He says, you have to be kidding me, right? The church is not a popularity contest. The church is a community of people who are centered around Jesus. Its leaders and its teachers are simply servants of Jesus. So while you might prefer one leader more than another, it's not worth dividing over and certainly not speaking poorly about each other. The center of the church is Jesus and the good news about who he is and what he's done. In chapters 5 through 7, Paul addresses some problems related to sex. There were a number of people sleeping around in the church. One guy with his stepmother, a number of other people still worshiping at the local temples to Greek gods and sleeping with the prostitutes who worked there. Not only that, but there were people in the church who were saying that this was all just fine. They said, hey, we're free in Christ. God's grace is bottomless, right? It's fine. Paul says it's not fine. And with the gospel in hand, he shows just how wrongheaded this kind of thinking is. He says, remember, first of all, Jesus died for your sins, including the ruin of broken relationships that's caused by sexual misconduct. And so if you're a Christian, Sexual integrity is one of the main ways that we respond to Jesus' love and grace. Paul also reminds them that just as Jesus was physically raised from the dead, so our bodies will be raised from the dead, which means this. If your body is being redeemed by Jesus now and in the future, then what you do with your body matters. It matters a lot. And it's not yours to do whatever you want with. Paul's being super clear. Being a follower of Jesus involves no compromise when it comes to sexual integrity. In chapters 8 through 10, the issue is about food, but not just food preferences, like do you like or dislike a certain food. The issue the Corinthians were divided over is meat that came from animals sacrificed in the local temples to Greek and Roman gods. And there was a split between the Jewish and non-Jewish Christians about how to respond to this issue. And once again, Paul appeals to some core ideas from the gospel. He says, our allegiance, first and foremost, is to Jesus as Lord, not to any other gods. And so if you're in a situation where there's meat that's been dedicated to another god, and there are people around who might watch you and conclude, oh, look, hey, Christians worship Jesus, and they can worship other gods too. Paul says, if that's the scenario, don't eat the meat. Your loyalty is to Jesus, and you should love those people more than yourself and not mislead them. But Paul quickly qualifies this and says, listen, as Christians, we believe God is the creator of all things, including that animal. And the temple idols, we believe, are just pieces of wood and stone. So if there's no one around who's going to misunderstand your actions and you're hungry, eat up. You're free as a new human in Christ to follow your conscience in these kind of debatable matters. So what makes it okay in one situation to eat, but not in the other? The core principle is love. Love will deny itself 
and look out for the well-being of other people. And love, God's love, is at the core of the gospel. It's what Jesus did when he died for us, and so Paul says it's what Christians should do for other people. In chapters 11 through 14, Paul moves on and addresses problems in their weekly worship gathering. There were some people who were having really powerful spiritual experiences in the gathering, and so they would start praying out loud in unknown languages. There were other people who might start sharing a teaching or a word from God, and then someone would get up and interrupt them because they wanted to share. And it all was really chaotic, and it was distracting people, especially visitors, from hearing the gospel. So in these chapters, Paul helps them think, first of all, about the purpose of this gathering to help them see what kind of behaviors are appropriate. He says the gathering is a place where God's spirit should be working through everybody and it should happen in a unified way. So he develops this cool metaphor about the church as a human body. It's one, but it has all these different parts. And each part serves a unique and important role. So he goes on to name a whole bunch of things that the Spirit does through all these different people, all for the building up of the church. That's a key phrase in these chapters. And Paul concludes that the highest value in the gathering should be a concept central to the gospel, God's love. And love is a key word in these chapters too. Love will compel each person in the gathering to use their role to serve and seek the well-being of others. So Paul applies all this to the Corinthians' problems. Some people think the purpose of the gathering is to have intense spiritual experiences or to get a chance to speak their mind. And Paul says, listen, I'm a big fan of powerful experiences of prayer, but if it distracts other people or freaks them out, I should stop it because I'm loving myself more than I'm loving those people. The gathering around Jesus should be orderly so everybody can learn and sing and worship and hear God speaking to them. The last problem Paul addresses is the issue of Jesus' resurrection and the future hope of Jesus' followers. There were some people in the church who were saying that the idea of resurrection is ridiculous and doesn't really matter to being a Christian. And Paul reacts to this big time. He begins by saying that the resurrection is an indispensable part of the gospel. We believe in it because of the hundreds of eyewitnesses that saw Jesus alive in a physical body after being publicly executed by the Romans. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Paul says, then his death was meaningless. We are all still lost in our sin and selfishness. We should just stop being Christians. Paul then shows in detail how the resurrection was Jesus' victory over death and evil, how it's a source of life and power for us now in the present, and how it's a promise of future hope for the whole world. It's because of the resurrection that we have a reason to be unified around Jesus. It's the reason we have motivation for sexual integrity. It's the source of power for loving other people more than ourselves. And ultimately, it's our hope for victory over death. And so, Paul concludes, we do believe Jesus was raised from the dead, which means this. The gospel is not just moral advice or a recipe for private spirituality. It's an announcement about Jesus that opens up a whole new reality. And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about, seeing every part of life through the lens of that gospel. 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1 Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, 
but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2 And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. 
For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death, or the present, or the future. All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. 1 Corinthians 4 This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want, already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings, and would that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. 
I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love in a spirit of gentleness?